Hey, what's up guys? In this video, we'll be talking about curve fitting. This is a technique used widely in data analytics, statistics, and it's also a fundamental building block for the fields of machine learning and AI. So it's a very interesting topic and it's one of my favorites. Let's get started. Let's suppose that we've gathered and recorded a bunch of housing data. And what we want to do is try to see if there's any relationship between how much area a house takes up and how much it costs. And we're going to do this by trying to fit a polynomial curve to the data. But for the purposes of this video, we're only going to focus on how to fit a straight line. This is called linear regression. And after you've mastered this, it's not that difficult to learn how to fit higher order polynomials like quadratic or cubic or even crazier looking functions to your data set. So how are we going to do this? Well, we know that the format of a linear equation is y equals mx plus b, where m represents the slope of the line and b represents the y-intercept. But for our purposes, we're going to change up this notation a little bit. And instead of y, we're going to call it h of theta. And instead of m, we're going to use theta. And we'll keep the x the same. And for now, we won't worry about the y-intercept. We'll get back to that later. So this function right here, we call the hypothesis function because we can use it to form hypotheses about the price of a house given how much area it takes up. We can use this to construct straight lines and find the one that fits the data the best. But we have to start off somewhere. So for now, let's set the value of theta, which is also a slope. Let's set the value of this parameter equal to zero. And so our hypothesis function will actually look like a straight line because our slope is zero. And we can see that this hypothesis function is not such a great fit for the data. So we're going to have to do some work. Ultimately, curve fitting involves messing around with the parameters in our hypothesis function. In this case, we only have one, which is theta, to find the perfect combination which constructs a curve that best fits the data. Although randomly testing out different values for the slope of this hypothesis function might seem like a good idea, we want to go for the more accurate answer. And as we start playing around with higher order polynomials, like quadratics, we'll have more than one parameters to deal with. And we'll need a better method to find the best combination of values to assign each of the parameters. So first, let's design a mathematical tool that'll help us measure how well a hypothesis function is fitting our data. And here's how we're going to do that. Let us pick a random house from the data, such as this one, and call it house number i. And let's see how much it actually costs. And let's call that yi for the actual price of the house. Then we'll plug in how much area this house takes up into our hypothesis function, which happens to be a straight line, and see what the hypothesis function thinks this house should cost. Let us give a name to the predicted price and call it h of x sub i. Now what we're going to do is take the difference between the predicted price and what it actually costs and let's go ahead and actually square it and divide it by two times the total number of houses and let's call that m. And we want to measure how well does our hypothesis function fit all the data points not just that one. So let's actually iterate through all of these data points one by one and sum up each of the individual results of this equation from i equals 1 to m houses in our data set. And this right here is actually called our cost function. And this is amazing because now, believe it or not, we have a tool to represent how well our hypothesis function fits our data because we're going through each of these houses and we're finding the actual price for each of them and subtracting that from how much the hypothesis function thinks it'll cost. And you'll find out why we squared this difference very soon. Let us call this cost function j of theta. And let's actually plot it on two axes. On the horizontal axis, we'll label theta. And on the vertical axis, we'll label the value of the function or the cost. So right now, theta is 0. And the average squared error is pretty high. And if we were to plot j of theta for various different values of theta, we would actually notice that it turns out 
to be a to be a bowl shaped plot. And this nice clean bowl shaped property is because we squared the difference. And what we want to do is we want to actually minimize, we want to minimize this cost function so that we get the least error or least cost. And so that way we'll know that we found the best line of fit for this data. So right now we're over here, but we want to work our way downwards over here. So let me actually rewrite our cost function, substituting in our hypothesis function. So we have the sum from i equals 1 to m of theta times xi. This is our hypothesis function, h of theta xi, minus y of theta, the actual price, squared over 2 times the number of houses. So how do we minimize this function? There are many different algorithms to do this. But a very common algorithm, which is used in machine learning and AI, is called gradient descent. One way of minimizing a function is by calculating its derivative and finding where it's close to zero, indicating local minima or maxima. In this case, our cost function looks like this. And we want to work our way downwards this way. And calculating the derivative will give us the ability to find the direction of greatest change of this cost function at several different points, aka give us the slope at any point. So if we plug in this value into the derivative, it'll give us the slope of this point, of the cost function over there. And if we plug in the value over here, we'll get the slope over there, and so on. So we're looking for the value of theta, which when plugged into the derivative, will result in a rate of change, or the slope, of zero. And that way we know that we've minimized this cost function so that we'll end up with a line of best fit with the least error. And here's the way we can do that. It turns out that if you calculate the derivative with respect to theta, which will be dj of theta over d theta, we get 1 over m times the summation from i equals 1 all the way to m of theta x i minus y i times x i outside the parentheses but still part of the summation. And so this is our magic function called the derivative. And once we plug in various values of theta, we'll know the slope or the rate of change of the cost function. So we want to find where this is approximately zero so that we know that we've reached the minimum of the cost function. Simply setting this equal to zero and solving for theta is one way to do it. And although it might not seem that complex at this stage, imagine doing that for hypothesis functions that are much crazier and involve many different thetas. It gets fairly complex, so we want a concrete method that we can use to try to minimize the cost function. And the algorithm we're going to use is gradient descent. Here's how it works. For each of the parameters theta, in this case we only have one, we're going to take that parameter and set it equal to, this by the way is the assignment operator, which just means that I'm setting the value of this equal to something, and it's used in many different programming languages. So we're going to set the value of this parameter theta equal to the current value minus the slope or rate of change of the cost function evaluated at theta. Right now, we're over here. The cost is very high because theta is equal to zero right now. But if we move theta, in the direction that is descending, in the direction that this derivative is indicating, we'll make this, we'll make the cost function lower and lower, and we'll approach the local minimum. And so why the minus sign? Well, let's have a look at it. Currently, the derivative of the cost function at theta equals zero is negative. And since two negatives make a positive, we'll actually increase the value of theta, which is indeed one step closer to the local minimum. If the derivative instead turns out to be positive, then we'll move theta to the left as a result of the minus sign. And we don't want to take just one step downwards. We want to take many different steps until we converge to a local minimum. So we're actually going to repeat this, repeat this step, until convergence. That just means that we'll keep going until we find that the cost function has reached a constant value. That should approximately be zero. And to give us a little bit more control on how big steps we take each iteration, we'll attach a constant alpha to the derivative term. 
and alpha usually ranges from values such as 0 0.1 or 0 0.01 or 0 0.001. You can play around with this value and see what results you get. But be careful because setting an extremely large value of theta will actually cause you to take extremely big steps and your function will actually start diverging like so. And we won't approach any local minimum at all. So we don't want to do that. And setting alpha to a very low value will cause us to take extremely many steps and it'll take a very long time to converge. So we want to find the best value. And finally, for hypothesis functions where we have more than one parameter's theta, we do this update step for all the thetas that we have. Theta 1 gets assigned the value of theta 1 minus alpha times a partial derivative, which, don't worry, it sounds fancy and it looks kind of strange. But all it's really doing is just finding how the cost function is changing with each individual parameter. If you have more than one parameters, such as two, the cost will change when either of the two parameters or both are changed. And so what the partial derivative does for us is that it only calculates how the cost function is changing with respect to one individual parameter at a time. And we can repeat this update step in, in our loop for however many parameters you have by calculating the partial derivative of the cost function with respect to each parameter individually. If you have two parameters, the cost function will actually look more like a 3D surface such as like this. And minimizing a cost function like this actually has a graphical representation of starting off higher on the hill and manipulating the theta coordinates to work our way downwards to the local minimum. So there we have it, our gradient descent algorithm. So now if you want to see this in action, it's often useful to plot j of theta along with the data that we're working with overlapped by the hypothesis function that we're trying to fit. So right now our hypothesis function is a straight line, and it's not a very good fit to the data. So let's see what will happen if we run our gradient descent algorithm. We start off up all the way over here, because theta is equal to zero, and so the error is fairly large. After one iteration of the gradient descent algorithm, we'll walk one step down this way, and our theta could be equal to something around one. So our hypothesis function does have a slope, so it'll start looking more like that. And as we work our way downwards more and more, our value of theta will start to increase. And as this value increases, our line will start looking more like it fits the data. And after the gradient descent algorithm ends, because the cost function has converged to a very small value, we will have our magic line which best fits this data. And we've done it. We've taken a set of data points and found the line of best fit. Finally, let's talk about what happens if we add a different kind of data set. Let's say one that looks a little bit more like this. Maybe for this example, a line will not be the best form of fit. We'll need to use a different type of function, and you can play around with them. Let's say we want to use a cubic function like this. In that case, our, our hypothesis function will look a little bit more like this. And so our gradient descent algorithm in this case will have to include update rules for each of the parameters theta. And that'll involve taking various partial derivatives of the cost function with respect to each of the thetas. So that is how you can build upon what you've learned from this video and fit higher order polynomials to your data sets. And I almost forgot, we didn't use the y-intercept in our hypothesis function for the line. If we wanted to, we could let that be the second parameter in addition to the slope, remembering to let gradient descent update that parameter as well. And our line will actually not only change in the angle, but will also shift up and down. So that's pretty much it guys. In this video we covered how to find the line of best fit, and then we also talked about how we can extend these methods to, to use higher order polynomial functions to fit your datasets. So if you guys made it till the end, thank you so much. I really appreciate it, and I hope you guys found this just as interesting as I did. Um, if you're here for a class, I hope this also helped. I might do some other videos in the future explaining other uh, topics and maybe building upon those covered in this video. And if you guys are familiar with any programming languages, I encourage you guys to test this out on your own and uh, implement the code for this and see if you guys can get curves to fit your own data sets.
The methods that we discussed in this video are pretty much the building blocks of machine learning and AI because much of the concepts in uh, machine learning are essentially just advanced ways of curve fitting and how to find the best um, polynomial to fit your data sets. So once again, thank you guys so much and I'll see you next time.